Hi everyone and welcome to episode number five in the three books series. I am very happy and excited to announce that my guest for this episode is Dr. Greg Sadler. Greg Sadler is a philosopher, but his selections, interestingly, and to, for me, surprisingly, uh, were three works of fiction. The first uh, is a book called The Beginning Place by Ursula K. Le Guin. The second, a book by Philip K. Dick called A Scanner Darkly. And third, uh, a book titled The Labyrinths, uh, a collection of essays, parables, short stories by uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Very interesting selections. I enjoyed reading, uh, uh, I completed The Beginning Place and A Scanner Darkly, and I read in preparation for this conversation uh, some of the chapters from The Labyrinths, and I enjoyed uh, everything that I've read so far. The main reason that I added this introduction to the beginning of the the main the converse, the main part of the episode is that I want to warn you about the poor uh, audio quality. Um, if you are not patient enough with uh, poor audio, as I tend to be, uh, you don't have to listen to the whole thing. So be be prepared. Be prepared uh, to make that decision. Um, it, it was a little bit unfortunate, but we had the technical difficulty and it. Uh, the audio is, uh, might be, you might find it okay, but I find it a little bit difficult to listen to. Um, I hesitated a bit whether to upload the video at all, but I would like to have a record of it. I enjoyed the conversation. I think the, um, I think it, the content is good. Let's see. I hope you listen and uh, you enjoy. With that, uh, let's begin. I'm honored to, today to be joined uh, by Greg Sadler. Greg Sadler is the co-founder and president of uh, Reason.io, which is a company that provides a range of educational and learning resources uh, for philosophy, philosophical study. Uh, Greg received his PhD from Southern Illinois University, and he has, uh, he has held many different academic posts, different places, and a very productive YouTube channel that is devoted to f philosophy, especially for, for beginners. So it is a great place to start. And he is one of my role models when it comes to education and study and, and philosophy. So I'm very happy to be joined by you, Greg. Welcome. Well, well I, I'm equally happy to be to beer. I, I always enjoy our conversations and, um, you know, the way that you're, you're doing these conversations is quite interesting as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Mm. So as a philosopher, I was surprised that you chose three works of literature, three works of fiction. And I'm interested to, to hear about, interested in hearing about your selection process and whether you have a different department for reading, for your reading experience, that you go away from philosophy to read something different or that you bring your philosophical thinking to different domains of study and different domains of reading. That's an interesting I mean, I, do, I inevitably do both. Do both. Um, mm. and, and I, you know, I, I like to read fiction and, and uh, some, some nonfiction stuff as well. Some, sometimes there's a break from philosophy. And I was very happy to find out that I'm not the, the only one who does this, that G.E. Moore um, mm. wrote about himself. And he, he criticized himself for doing that. He thought they had too much time, time reading novels and not enough, enough time reading philosophy. <laughs> it's, mm. it's a good way to, you know, to unwind a bit. Actually, Lucian of Sansota is true history. He starts out, I don't know if you've ever taken a look at it, in the very beginning of it, he says, I'm writing this kind of crazy work, and it's actually the first work of science fiction. Because um, mm. it has like a journey to the moon and space battles and things like that. He says, I'm writing this this just a whole bunch of lies is to a lot, a lot of people who spend a lot of time thinking about deep and long lofty subjects, uh, unwind them a bit, sort of like, you know, how ex you exercise all, all the time, you have some downtime. So I, I think that, you know, literature can be like that. I would up being attracted to literature that's rather philosophical in its, mm -hmm. it, its themes and it's, um, uh, in the way that authors themselves work them out, uh, Green and Hayes and Philip K. Dick, they're all very um, philosophically literate and 
what we call, we call like, you know, they're not just interested in philosophy. They think through, through philosophy and bring it into, into their, their mm-hmm. stories. And if I, if I had to pick fourth, I was, I was thinking about this earlier today, I probably would have picked Dostoyevsky as the possessed, which for me mm-hmm. is sort of the, the epitome of the philosophical novel. Um, mm-hmm. but, it, but, it, but it didn't make it in there. So we, we have these three, three instead. Um, and and I, I you know I've I've talked, talked elsewhere about like you know what philosophical books um, influenced me in my development. So I thought it'd be good to talk about other works that I that I knew had 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 a big impact on me and me in my event at different right. points in my my life. And so you know what I've got here is a little bit bit more we could say existential, mm. even though none of these three are existential. <laughs> mm. To prepare for our conversation today, I. Uh, read uh, The Beginning Place by Le Guin and uh, A Scanner Darkly. And they, they were both very rich experiences. Uh, and that, that philosophical after effect was also there. So the story on itself, it stands on its own as a very enjoyable, interesting experience yeah. in very different ways. And then there is this, once I leave behind the book, then there's this after, philosophical after effect. And I, I can start to think about the ideas that, Maybe not necessarily they were the starting point for the writer. Maybe they weren't. Maybe he wasn't having a philosophical idea. And then, okay, what story can I tell to embody this idea? But maybe they yeah. just naturally grow out of the story. And yeah, the, the I mean, that makes sense. Um, again, you know, all, all of these authors are people who have philosophy on the brain, brain begin with. And, and philosophy in the very broad sense of like engage, engagement with ideas that, that uh, matter and can, can affect people. And so it makes sense that we would find things in, in the stories, whether they want to put them in there or not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can begin with, because we talked a little bit before about a beginning place. So maybe we can begin with the, a scanner darkly. Sure. Uh, yeah. And, and say that um, before, before we get into it. So the, the, the books that I picked, Scanner Darkly is, you know, what I think to be uh, Philip K. Dick's best best novel, and, and I'll talk about why in just a minute. But I came to Dick pretty pretty late in in my life, um, and then there's a whole story there about how I was kind of a snob about it for a long time, and um, then uh, Borges Labyrinths, um, his short stories and parables and essays there, there, that is from my college days, and then then the beginning place is from from my my early adolescence. So mm-hmm. each one ties is in a particular lifetime for me. Um, so Scanner, Scanner Day, um, you know, Dick had other really, really evil novels. Everybody knows, you know, Dino Dan's Dream of Electric Sheep she, because it, it, you know, gave the, the foundation for the Blade Runner. And it's a great novel. Um, and, and he's, he's had other short stories that have been adapted into, into films. And um, for a long time, time kind of felt like the, the Dick, Dick novel that I enjoyed the most, most was Man in the High Castle. Um, which also had a fairly decent Amazon adaptation, uh, mm-hmm. which went pretty far off, but but it was was still quite good, and and, um, and, and it was it was so because it was not just not just of the novel itself, but the ideas is that he was playing around with, and, and I also really liked uh, you know um, some of the other novels. And I, I wound up settling on Scanner Darkly after rereading a lot of Dick stuff. Just because I think it's, it's it's actually one that's closest to home for him, he talks about this. This is, um, you know, he saw an entire generation, his generation, dying off, and being caught between these two forces, both of which could suck you in. You in a sort of oppressive, policing, drug, drug or bad. You know, if you if you do them, you're a terrible, terrible person. And then, then you know, the drug pushers, because it actually turns it turns out the drug bad. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, they're bad for the same reason as the uh, forces of morality and rightness think they are. And then, you know, being, you know, being caught in, in the middle there. Um, and it's, it's such a, um, you know, it's, it's so many of the different, different themes Dick likes to play around with personal identity and um, these characters who are stuck in bad situations and have to think about what's the, what's the right thing to do and they're tempted to do other things are self-serving. Um, and, and Dick himself was, was somebody who, what I realized was when I read novels was he was somebody 
who now had studied philosophy and theology and psychology and anything else he could get his hands on. And not in any sort of academic way. <laughs> he would just get, get his hands on, on what was going on. Um, he he, he um, would, would think these ideas through, and then he would um, put, put them into the minds of his characters. There's a lot of indirect discourse in his novels where they're playing around with, around with an idea, and he's, he's doing applied philosophy better than most applied, applied philosophers are. You know, he comes up better thought ex- experiments. He um, comes up with better, better dilemmas. He works through the implications of th- things, and he usually usually does so kind of eccentric way, way, uh, you know, you know, very academic, you know, situated, situated in his life. And so I, I, I really like that, and um, so I'll I'll tell you why I came to Dick late, and then I'll I'll tell you about. Scanner. Well, we have some conversation about Scanner Darkly because I'm interested, interested in what you got on Scanner Darkly too. Mm-hmm. So, so when I was in grad, grad school, there was this great uh, bookstore store called Riz News. And they had all of the cutting edge theory stuff and a lot of, a lot of cool magazines. And they also, also read the independent, you know, art, art sort of arty videos nobody else has had. It's a cool place to, to be in. And the p- people who own were cool p- people as well. And there was, and there was a whole section of Phil K. Dick stuff. And I saw these hippie types come in. And we actually did have a lot of uh, genuine hippies down in Southern Illinois. The rainbow people, people come through um, and they're, they're heavy smoking back then. And, and a lot of them bought the Dick, Dick stuff because he had a reputation, you know. And I thought, eh, if, it's, if it's for them, it's probably not for me. And there was like an entire shelf of the stuff. And so I was, I was like, that's, that's just, just, you know, garbage. And I didn't, I didn't even there to read it. Mm. And a fr- friend of mine equally was like, uh, but, but who'd actually had some, um, he, he gave a copper or a copy of uh, the Android's dream, dream of a sheep. And he, the way he said it was, you know, I had to teach this in class, that's the garbage. Do you want this book? Because otherwise I'm, th- I'm throwing it out. I was like, well, well, I'll take a look at it, you know, because it's the Blade Runner. And then I got home and promptly like threw it on the bookshelf and didn't, didn't take a look at it for mm-hmm. the next 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was... I, I'd moved, uh, you know, out of Carbondale, and I, I went to Indiana. I was teaching, teaching there for a long time, and living with, with my family, family land. And then my job got, got phased out uh, because I was teaching in the prisons, and I went down to North Carolina, where I had my, my next teaching appointment. And North Carolina, Pittsville uh, had 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 a wonderful downtown law library. There were these. Um, I forget exactly what the end of the edition is. I think I think it's Library of America. They have these these really nicely done. Um, editions and there were these these uh, books there for and i was in the science fiction thing and there were like four, like four novels from the you know the 60s these files from the 70s these philip k dick things so i was like well maybe i'll, I'll give it a try people have been done talking about it and i started re- reading them things like martian time slip and, and dr money and and i thought and you know you know um uh i didn't read scanner Dar- darkly at the time but i read uh, val alice and other ones and I thought well this is really amazing some stuff and I, I, I would just you know read my way through as much of it as I could get and so then by the time that I got to Scanner Darkly which I read read after Flow My, Tear, Flow My Tears of Police Policemen so, which is another really great one I, I was sort of primed, primed for it I read a lot of of dick stuff along the way interestingly i watched the movie like years before that <laughs> you know? mm. the, the uh the rototype i think it's called mm, the, i don't know the rotoscope uh, the the, mm. the, the tune te- technique that is with that um and so but it, but it had been long enough that i didn't remember re- 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 the plot points and mm. so i was just sort of a vague familiar with it and you know the the interaction uh you, you essentially have a guy who's spying on himself yeah. And yeah. splits off into two two personalities, uh, facilitated by the fact that he's got that that suit, and I forget exactly what they call it. That the scramble suit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know he's he's got this romantic attraction to Duntana, uh, mm-hmm. who's playing him at the same time, and everybody's but he's ultimately playing some somebody in one way or another, another in that thing. And the final scene was sad. Uh, him essentially is a burnt out husk who will be able to carry out some programming. And one, and one thing that, that Dick said in there that really, really clicked with me, and this is, this is a theme in a lot of his, his, his work, it's very philosophical, is do we want to be operating in a sort of an automatic way in terms of our thoughts and desires and, 
actions, or do we want to be at least to some degree, degree autonomous? If, if we if we do want to be autonomous, then, then you know we're, we're responsible, and that kind of sucks in some ways because we can get the things wrong. But um, what ended up happening with the drugs was, was that they X words reduced people's the level of in, insects, which for him was, was sort of the meta- metaphor for for the being who's been reduced to ju- just a stimulus of stimuli and responses. Uh, they've, they've in effect lost their humanity, even though they have human shape. And I, he's, he's quite right that that does, that does have to, to, to people in a lot of different ways. Trauma can, can, can end up that when people are never able to get, get out of that. Um, some people do allow themselves to be, be reduced to through a sort of, of uh, laziness in their, in their life that just allows them to be guided along by some sort of biology that you know, satisfies their, their desire and, and after it becomes almost ossified. So he's, he's got his finger on a, a real danger and he's framing it in terms of, of drugs um, and the drug war. And, and it's clear too, one of the other things I really like about Dick, that you can also say about Le Guin, is that he's, um, he's sympathetic to his characters. Mm-hmm. Even the ones who are dirt pigs or cops or, um, you know, there's something else that's really wrong with them. Um, he doesn't, doesn't forgive them, but mm-hmm. he, he does, does try to understand their perspective and allow them to speak for, them, for themselves. They, they, have, they have moments of, of potential of growth or taking a different course or things like that that you don't often see in, in sci-fi or fantasy. Or mm-hmm. right, right where the bad guys are, where the good guys are, or it's like all gray, gray, you know, and, and and anybody could, you know, you know, do anything. Usually, all gray just means all black. You know? mm-hmm. um, yeah, so, yeah. There's definitely a compassionate voice in his description of the characters. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. There's there's comp- a lot of compassion. Uh, there is this unforgettable moment. I don't know why it is so unforgettable and powerful. It really shook me when I read. Very simple description of there's a moment where he is with Donna and Donna is talking about her fantasy of one day leaving and going away somewhere. And then he's, he asks her, maybe I can go with you. And then she says, no, oh, I, I can't. I can't take you. You know that. And then she holds his hand for a few seconds and then let's go. Yeah. And then he describes that. And then for the rest of his days, for, uh, even when they were not together anymore, they, were, they couldn't see each other and he wasn't aware of what that was happening to her. He never for, forgot that moment, that, that felt sense of uh, her holding his hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, that, it, left, it left an imprint on, on, on him, as you could say. say. Mm-hmm. And he can do it without really writing uh, polished prose. Yeah. Because he's, he's accompanying these characters that are not themselves very polished. Uh, they're not very uh, well-structured, well-organized. They're fragmented. So he's accompanying them and he's describing them with a, with a prose that is appropriate with it, with, congruent with them. But he can still manage to make that impact without uh, apparently writing well. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very true. I, and, and, you know, Dick wrote, he called real, real novels that were a com- complete flop. I mean, they're, they're really great. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, like, uh, oh, uh, Con- Confessions of a Map Artist or... Uh, Milton Lumpke territory, um, and they were, you know, the people who he pitched them to, they were like, just stick to science fiction, body, body, you know. He <laughs> was very disheartened by it. Sir Darkly was originally supposedly written as a realistic novel, and then in order to it not to, not to be rejected, he, he introduced some science fiction themes to it. I um, see. Wow. Which, which it makes makes sense. He he knew um, how to do that. But it, it's interesting when you when you look at his fiction stuff. Stuff not usually like like you know lasers and space monsters and things like that. Uh, you know, there, there's occasionally some things like that, like in uh, uh, the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, right? But but um, where Palmer Eldritch is a space monster, but it, it's usually like salesman. Know, or um, pyramid or uh, private eyes or you know kind of kind of ordinary types not um, not these these elevated mm-hmm. uh, people of prophecy that are going to change the universe for the better you know? mm-hmm. yeah 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 he's, he's, for, for people who are watching this who haven't read the book a scanner darkly mm. I can promise that from the very beginning it is going to be a page turner 
when he's he begins with a with one of the characters Jerry I think if I'm not mistaken where he believes that he's uh, covered constantly with these little creatures I forgot the names yeah. but just the way he describes his point of view his beliefs his skepticism of other people's judgments and that is also a big theme in the book the skepticism of how far we can go being skeptical of the reality of the appearances and uh yeah yeah how much we rely on each other and if we stop relying on each other then everything can become a every scene can become basically a potentially a trick that somebody is playing on us and you know dick was very uh interested in gnosticism this idea that the world what we have in front of us is is actually um as he put it in, in some case a uh, uh, iron prison and mm -hmm. that uh, we had to escape to somewhere else. And the Gnostics were never very good at explaining escape to what. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, and with Dick, I mean, part of what redeemed him from Gnosticism is losing earlier compassion, connection, connection to other people, this realization that other people matter. You get you get the sense that with some some of the characters, they, they could be okay with the the world, you know, falling apart so long as they could still hold on to each other. But if that one, that then it's not just a, you know simply about keeping a, a vision of the world and intact epistemologically. So mm -hmm. something deeply rooted in our, our nature. And, and he was a person who really did struggle with relationships. Um, um, I mean, five marriages. Um, he uh, like like I mentioned. I think I I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but he had a correspondence, occasional phone call with Ursula K. Le Guin. And, and uh, she, from her point of view, uh, he knew that she thought he thought he went of nuts, and he she didn't want him to like like meet up her because she didn't want to be involved with somebody who was into the the drug scene. Um, and she knew knew that he he was, and she had kids and all that. Um, they'd actually gone to high school together, but but she she didn't remember him from high school, and he didn't mm -hmm. remember her. It must mm -hmm. have been a big a big high school. And, and um, yeah, the, the, you know. Uh, there was this this sense of loss of relationships with him, uh, and and that another theme in quite a few of his his, his stories, stories as well. Um, this this time of losing people in in Scanner Dark, Dark losing people to largely to um, either being jailed or to overdoses on on drugs or to burning their brains out or things just like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's other ways in which people can, can be lost as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, forgive me for this question if it is too silly, but substance D, do you think it is related to, is it a metaphor for death? Well, well that, at one point, I think they say them there, don't they? Right, right. Um, and maybe because they say it, it maybe it is not. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, in the flaw that it's, it's, it's um, from in the end, and it has some Latin name. The, the second part of the name is ontologicus, if I remember right. Um, so he's, he's, and I think he, he didn't think that a lot of his audience would get onto that, that mm. you know, just like other science fiction, fiction reading it. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, it is supposed to be saying something more about the human condition, but that, 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 um, is it an epilogue at the very end that he has where he says, I saw all of this happen. And, um, you know, I, I originally saw the the, the drug culture as, as something liberatory and now that it's 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 the opposite of it they're almost as bad as the cops um mm. i don't I, I don't know that he's trying to allegorize mm. in a in a philosophical way the way i think mm -hmm. he's doing things something different there mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think that's i i don't know maybe that can work uh, in the you know so-called unconscious, we don't have to demand mm -hmm. for for experience of reading literature to to become necessarily philosophical. It can just do its work. Um, That's a good good and, way to put it. A churning away away underneath. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. what it offers is itself so rich the concrete the concreteness of the situations, characters, the relationship, which is something we cannot get from philosophical texts. They are more about. Yeah, uh, it, interestingly, if we want the philosophical texts to do their, their jobs, um, this is the only world that we get. So, I mean, we, we can abstract away 
with our imagination or intellects or whatever into or, or computer modeling into some sort of abstract world world in which uh, thought thought experiments work the way they're designed and you know moral lemmas aren't, aren't already lobbied on one one side or the other and don't come come at the wrong time but that's not, not the life we actually have, we have in front of us and you know, I thought Aristotle, it's, and it's not, it's not just Aristotle says this, uh, but he says it in his Nicomechanics. He taught people who are really, really good at reading books and using the categories that they get from them. Um, and he says, ethics is really about like making the right choices and doing the right things. Is it's not a it's not a primarily theoretical activity, a practical activity. I'm writing a book here. Here, this is theoretical, but I'm giving you outlines. He, he actually used metaphor. I'm giving, giving you outlines, and you have to color in the the interiors of them by applying it to the specific things. Well, that's that's what K. Dick is doing in his book, books, but he doesn't have a unified theory. The characters and sort of bringing in theories here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you know, which they've misunderstood in certain way. <laughs> and then, then try, trying to figure out how can they possibly apply this, and then they always operate under um, a condition of insufficient knowledge. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of leaps of faith, and and um, sometimes getting screwed over, over and, and sometimes mm-hmm. being you know caught by somebody on the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some guesswork, some crazy guess that then later you pursue for a long time to realize it's not, it wasn't true. But that's what the uh, are, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, um, so to contrast, in contrast to uh, Philip K. Dick, then we have this very different writer, uh, Borges. Yeah. Labyrinth. And uh, if I, if the image that comes to my mind is if we think about uh, Le Guin and Dick as Describers, they present mm. themselves at least as the describers, observers. Yeah, I get a really strong image in Borges as a, a, an architect, as somebody who's making things, as constructing things, and almost uh, I want to call him a metaphysical ar- architect. <laughs> yeah, what he's doing is very different. Although that's a, that's a really good metaphor for he is an architect in the way way that. Uh, architect they are they they do plans and they don't, they don't actually build anything that's up to the contractors and and the laborers to to you know put all the brick bricks in conduits and, and he doesn't worry about that he just sets mm. out the, the the major plan um and and you know he's got his office where he says well, wouldn't this be cool to do you know and he doesn't he doesn't have to worry worry about whether um things actually fit, fit together or not <laughs> mm. i mean he never writes a novel he only really writes short stories, uh, uh, poetry, um, essays, and then what he calls, calls parables, a few of which are, are found in, in here and here. And, mm-hmm. you know, somebody asked, asked him why he write novels. He said, ah, you know, I get to the end of a, the length of a short story. story. That's enough for me, you know. Mm. Uh, and, and they're very, like you said, they're very rich in, in ideas. Um, one of the things I always wanted to do with, with some of the stories in here is, is to think out what the, what the implication of them really, really would be. Could, would, would this be coherent? Could you, could you have a world that operated according to some of the uh, architecture that he's, he's mm-hmm. written in place? Like, it, could, you, could you have a city that's built, built you know, with these sort of, sort of plan? Mm-hmm. And I never actually did it, did it because I'm lazy myself. myself. <laughs> but I've, I've, been, I've had that idea of writing more haste since I was in college. And I made a few abortive attempts at it. But I never, I never really made any, any mm. progress on it. Uh, that would be very part, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, in part, it's it's, it's also easy just to like sit, sit there and kind of look and say, say, oh, it's really, really neat, you, you know, and, and not put it anything down on, on page because you're keeping it all up in your head. <laughs> right, right, right. I remember uh, uh, in college, I think first or second year in college, I had a friend who was into Nietzsche and existential philosophy, and you know, it was one of those like. In, introducers and uh, okay. he, one day he told me about he told he gave me a quote and he said something some pithy statement and i asked him tell me what this what do you mean by that and his response was just take it as it is don't explore it <laughs> just <laughs> just it is what it is <laughs> i don't know what it means and that i was sounds uh, cool yeah i was dissatisfied but what do you what do you uh, what do you mean your attitude towards these short stories is kind of like that we should follow through with them and see if they really can stand, can withstand further development, or will they collapse if you uh, kind of work through their implications? 
I that's one thing we could do. I mean, an, another thing, thing we could do is treat them, treat them sort of like objects in an art gallery and just, and just go in and, and, and you know, look at them. And, um, I mean, we, when, when we're engaged with a work of art, like say a painting in a gallery or a sculpture, um, we aren't purely passive. We're not just like sitting there like this with our eyes bulged open. Um, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're sort of reaching out to it in good intention, trying to make sense, sense of it. Um, and some works, works we can't do that effectively with, you know, you know and there's probably some maybe you would, would get, I wouldn't, and, and vice versa. Um, but we, I, think, I think we can do that with these story stories as well. And some, some of them are, you know, actually, actually quite good. And, um, detective stories as well mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah but what and, i mean what an imagination he had do you have a some some of the one of the one or two of the short stories or essays that oh. stand out for you yeah i'm actually looking at one, one right now the lottery in babylon um mm. which, which again, you know sort of, sort of like uh dick scan scannerly uh, um, mm -hmm. This wasn't or originally my favorite, but it's, but it's really, really because so. Do you know one? No. So it, it begins, I'll read the first couple lines and then I'll just sort of summarize it. He says, like all men in Babylon have been pro con, con like all a slave. I've also, know, also known a mint, a probrium imprisonment. Look, the, the index finger on my right hand is missing. Look, look through a rip in my cape, you can see a vermilion tattoo on my stomach. It is the second symbol, Beth. This letter on nights when the moon is full gives me power over, over men whose mark is gimel, but it coordinates me to the men I left who, who on most nights owe, owe obedience to those marked with, with gimel. And he, he, he goes and, you know, there's all, there's all this, this stuff that's, that's happening and, and tells the, the story of a, a lottery happening in Babylon. Um, originally, the, the lottery was for rich people and, and it's just a regular lottery. You pay in some money and you, you, can, you can win some, some things back. And then they found a way, the lottery, um, the people who run the lottery, uh, they, they found a way to make it more attractive, which was to introduce um, some unfavorable numbers where you might get a brand on you or you, or you might you know, lose your life, something like that. And uh, there's a couple different things happening at the same time. To the poor, poor revolt, where they're like, why do the, the rich get to enjoy, enjoy this crazy lifestyle? Well, we were shut out, out for it. So it, it becomes democratized. And then, then they also introduce a whole, whole bunch of, instead of having everything be quantitative in terms of winnings, they say, well, look, the, the, the penalties are quali qualitative, you know, dying. You can't compare that to that to a certain amount. Um, we need to have some qualitative win winnings as well. And so the, the, the lottery thing just, just kind of spirals outward. And pr pretty soon, nobody can tell whether the things that are ha happening to them are, the, are just the, the result of or the, the result of something that happened in, in a dra drawing. Because it could be that I draw something and it doesn't affect me, but it affects you. So um, eventually they, they come to take the position that, well, everything is really within, within the lottery. And this is a typical Warhays thing, right? You have some idea and the idea, idea sucks up and eats the entire world. Um, um, and mm. so their entire world be becomes a world that is dominated by a causality that we cannot understand, but it is administered by human beings in some way. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? Wow. So this idea that in the beginning begins as, as something very odd, and develops, 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 and then at some point we say, "Oh, we already are living in this with this exactly. idea." <laughs> yeah. I think about technology, right? And, right? and mobile cell phones, and and mm. the fact that we're, you know, we're essentially, essentially way across the world right now, communicating with each other, each other, uh, overcoming day and the night, and you know, a vast amount of distance. Mm. Um, mm. We take. I mean, this this world didn't exist just um, fifteen years ago. And here we are, we are making it as completely normal. You know? mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is uh, one very short essay, I think. Uh, it, it's not a story, it's an essay. It's, I, I'm trying to remember its title. It is, I think, Borges and I, or I. Oh, yeah. Borges, some, some variation on that. Yeah. Where he talks about, that was, I really enjoyed reading it because he describes his relationship uh, with himself, but two sides of himself, one being the, the writer and one being the human, uh, and that he's, he's, he exists to serve Borges, the writer. 
Yeah. And everything he does is to somehow keep him, um, keep him going, keep the writer going, keep him satisfied. Uh, That's one of the parables. It is, it is very short. Art. Um, let me read, read the lines. Here we go. Um, he says, says, it would be an exaggeration to say that ours is a, is a hostile relationship. I, I live, let myself go on living so that Borges may can contrive his literature, and this literature justifies me. It's no effort for me to confess that he has achieved some valid pages, but those pages cannot save me. Perhaps because what is good belongs to no one, not, not even to him, but rather to language and to tradition. And this, this is some, some, I mean, it touches on a theme that is very important in, those works in labyrinths and, and, and Borges uh, uh, works as a, as a whole, which is that of immortality. Is it po- possible to produce do something that, that is going to survive um, our, our physical death? Or, or is, is it, is that, you know, I mean, we can create like great, great literature, you know, um, uh, we can teach people, uh, you, you and I are you know, both familiar with the effects that we can have on, on students, you know, as students, the effects that other people had on us, um, oftentimes unintentionally. But, you know, doesn't all that fade away in the end? What can possibly provide us with, with the sort of endurance of, uh, of a metaphysical conception of substance like that, you know, that, that the philosophers have had? Um, and so it's a kind of mel- melancholy throughout all of Borges. Stuff, stuff. I think because of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, regardless of the sophistication that he has in his writing, he he has also a good relationship of alliance with the reader. Yeah, and it's always like, oh, come, come. I want to tell you something. I, <laughs> I always, it's always a feeling of as if it's in the middle of something. Oh, I, I, I found a book somewhere, and the second chapter of the book is always somehow in the middle. We find yeah. him in the middle of some investigation or in the middle of a thought, and then he. He's not pedagogical. He's, he's not like, oh, let me sit down. I will teach you something. No, he's like, I want to share you some pressing thought that it has been, that I'm obsessing over. And I, yeah, I enjoy and, that attitude. And he, he, he uses um, different, different takes from the literature that he enjoyed himself to do that. Sometimes it's an adventure story. Sometimes it's a detective story. Um, sometimes it's a, like a report that the academic might be giving. About, about mm-hmm. what's yeah. happening. There, there, I mean, the plan, uh, what, I always, always get the, the mix up, plan Ukbar Orbis Tertius, you, you know, the find this um, copy of uh, an encyclopedia and it's got an entry tree in, and then they're like, they're like well, where did this come from? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and then some sort of like med- meditation, what it would be, be to have a very different way of approach the world, like Fumes is the Memorius, the guy who. Mm can't forget anything um but doesn't remember the way that we we do you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. i mean i mean you know the other one that i really really like in here is avaro's search where he's he's taking you know uh, Ibn Rud or Avaros, as, as we call them in the West, and he, he's putting himself self in the mindset of, of this Islamic thick thinker, trying trying to understand uh, Aristotle's poetics. Aristotle's no drama. There isn't any drama in the Islamic world at the time, and yet there's somebody visiting from China where drama still exists, and and Avaros can't quite wrap his head around drama is and therefore can't fully understand what, what, what his person who he thinks is you know the most brilliant person ever aristotle had to say about mm. things you know yeah 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 i can offer a more contemporary example of my own personal life when i moved from iran to the to, to the west i was very shocked one of the elements of the culture shock was that in uh, in iran it hasn't really been established that we can as a collective as a group celebrate enjoy something yeah it's more when we when we gather it's usually it is more much more well established that we gather to mourn or right, to right. um to, to to protest about something or to re- represent our religious sentiments which is which has gravity in it it is not about celebration so i would always find it hard to relate to people like going to concerts like Going to just joyously and ecstatically celebrate. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, a concert would be a very, very different kind of experience. You know, um, this well, not just this, this but for the last year and a year and a half, I've been I've been teaching 
a class called the Humanities for Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And one of the um, textbooks that they selected for, for the class is Arjan Satrapi's Persepolis. And just volume one. And there's there's some, it's a graphic novel and it's, you know, very, very, it's very um, ornate one. It's pretty pretty sparse spare in, in, in its in aesthetic uh, but there's this interesting sex section in there if you've ever read it she she she's interested in, in kim Wilde, who i don't really don't really know iron maiden, maiden who i do because i'm a big big metal head and, and so is the exact, exact same age as me as well so she was growing up in an iran you know, in the revolution and then under the Islamic Republic at the same time that, that I was like seeing the hostage crisis play out. And, and she got into Iron Maiden Maid about the same time that I did as, as well. And, wow. you know, of course, under the, the Islamic Republic, you weren't, weren't going to have Iron Maiden coming to give a concert. <laughs> you know? she, she had her parents, when they went to, to Turkey, they smuggled in posters. Mm. Uh, she mounted her wall. And then when she, when she left, she, she parents eventually sent, sent her to... Um, First to Austria, she went up in, in France uh, because they, because they realized she was so headstrong, she probably would have gotten herself in, in she had already gotten herself in trouble. She'd probably have gotten herself killed eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, so they sent her away, away. And there was this scene, scene she's, she's unrolling the posters and she's, give, she's giving them to her friends. And I was ta- talking to my students about this. And um, they were like, oh, it's really nice. You know, she's like uh, sharing something of herself and her interests with them. And I said, now you realize that that being caught those posters would have meant at, at, the, at the very least um, a, be- a beating for her. So she's giving something thing that to, to her friends that can give them a beating. Are you sure this is a nice thing to do? <laughs> and of yeah. course, they, 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 uh, they, they didn't have much of an opinion on it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that the, the notion of, what what goes on in a con- concert? I mean, there's, there's some posturing, of course. Right? People sometimes get them stalled up, or guys get, get you know into fights or things like that. But usually at a music concert, everybody's there to have a good time and a mm-hmm. good time together. Otherwise, they just do it sitting on the couch watching a video. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, right. But the, the reference points are important to grasp that experience of a concert. Mm. Uh, there needs to be. It, it, there needs to be a, a established reference points and similar to Ibn Rushd, uh, Avaros, yeah. he, he didn't have the reference point of what the drama is, what, uh, how yeah, do you, you know, think about and, it? And Borges portrays him as getting like this close to it and then not being oh. able to get it, you know? Wow. Wow. Amazing. A missed Amazing. opportunity, you know, you know? Yeah. Right, right, right. I would say, uh, for readers, uh, I because I myself needed a little bit more patience with Borges than the other two books, but I think it is worth it. And it it is the the book among the three that invites for me the most rereading. So it yeah. it, it invites me. To, it's not a book from to, to start from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I mean I've I've had this copy be um, college, and I I I don't think I've ever read it cover to cover. Like mm. reading each story sequentially, I just sit down, sit down and say, which, which story do I want to read, read now? Or do I even want to read, read story? Maybe I should read the essays instead. Um, and and, and it's kind of funny because I, so I encountered Borges through, through this and I, because I was, you know, you know, very naive, I thought, well, this must be all of his stories, stories in this, it says selected. And then I, I encountered a few other things afterwards. Uh, um, and, you know, the, 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 the full set of series is, is all of this, you know, you know and very nice edition that we have. And when I finally got this, there were stories that I'd, I'd never even heard of before. It was, it was really fun encountering them uh, mm-hmm. and saying, oh, there's a new thing. Sort of like when I, when I would, you know, go library, Philip Dick wrote some, so many books. I've now actually read all of them. But for a long time, I could go and, oh, there's, a, there's one I haven't checked out before. You know, you know. Mm-hmm. But I also felt, and this, this is probably, probably a, uh, uh, something, you know, something not, not done on my part. I also felt like, what's this story doing in here you know this doesn't belong here maybe it's maybe a sort of conservatism on my part you know i know i know story belongs lines, but who the put, put this with this here <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, ridiculous thing about it right right mm. and it's it's really a luxury to have established trust in an author that yeah. allows us to then stay with it as opposed to if it is an unknown new author who is doing that co- collecting in the such a way that doesn't make sense you would probably be more quickly dismiss it yeah very yeah. true 
Yeah, we, we, we build up a sort of um, reservoir of, of goodwill with an author, I suppose right. you can say. You know, <laughs> they may have a few things that are not great. I and mean, we do this with, this with television shows and actors and other things as well. Well, you, know, you, you watch sketch comedy show and you, you, you see it a little before and you're like, well, this, this sketch wasn't very good, but I'm not going to turn it off yet because I, I think they'll do something good, good later on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> great. Uh, so should we say a few things about uh, Ursula K. Le Guin? Yeah, she's she's a, a wonderful science fiction and fantasy author. Um, very, very interesting to read her, her letters and essays and, and things like that, add in addition to stories. Um, mm-hmm. In part because she, she, you know, she was these people, eventually she declared herself to be in Kiss and a Feminist. These, these were stances that she had to sort of find her way in, into over the course of her life. And, and she came into writing about that right time. She, she, she was considered part of the new wave of science, science fiction. Uh, a lot of people like the Laz, Nancy and Mork, uh, who were getting away from just the, you know, lasers and space monsters and, you know, battleships and things like that and, and focusing on ecological and sociological and sometimes ecological themes. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and she's, she's a really wonderful writer. Um, um, the beginning place. It's not viewed by a lot, a lot of people as a particular, particularly work, <laughs> but, but I think it's quite good. And, and I, I know I you do as well from talking about it. About it. Um, and I mean, for me, for me, it was the right, the right book at the right time. I, I read it, it as either a seventh or eighth grader. So I would have been 12 or 13. And my dad had died um, when I was 11. You know, our, our family was in... First we were in mourning, mourning, then we were like trying to move on, and, and uh, there's a, the, the, the own, its own kind of kind of weirdness comes with that. Um, and uh, her book it, it resonated with, it with me, um, and, and because there's this, there's this undercurrent of sadness that runs through through that book in particular, and some of her other works as well. But that book is like a mag- magnet for it, and you've got these characters who. Um, aren't particularly attractive. They're, they're better than the people, people around them, but they don't realize that they're better. And cross over to this, this alternate world uh, where they're the only two people that, that know about it in the outside world and the people on the inside world don't, don't really know that this isn't another world. And um, each of them is attracted to somebody within, within that world. Uh, they don't like each, each other, but they have to work, work with each other, and eventually they do fall in a sort of love with, with each other. Mm-hmm. But it's not, there's nothing schmaltzy about it, you know? <laughs> there's mm-hmm. nothing, it, it's very, um, the real contrast is very sharp, you could say. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. They're, they're each sort of processing their own screwedness, their own damage, and they fi- find out that they do that together. Um, and in, for me, it was, it was really helpful because... It gave me some models about how a person might, might deal with those, those, those sorts of sorts of problems. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, what I was getting such other stuff off when it kind of came to what romantic relationships ought to look like. Like on the one hand, either that everything ought to be sexy, sexy all the time, and, uh, or, or it should be this kind of sappy, schmaltzy, Valentine's Day loving. And what's going on in, in um, a beginning place is... Um, it's neither of those. It's it's, and I, I don't want to say that it's just in the middle in the sense of like being a happy medium. It's it's, it's sort of higher up. But there's, it's a real, real kind of love that they have with each other, real sexuality. And, and um, I mean, as a teenager, of course, my was 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 really really quite us. So so I can't say the book provided me the perfect blueprint, you know? but it certainly gave me at least one model for how things might look. You know. Sure, sure, I understand. Uh, what I really appreciate about the book is, it is not, at least it portrays characters that don't have already established categories that they're mm. applying them as, to experience as the experience shows up, but they are forming the categories. And it is, yeah, in that yeah. sense, it is very poetic. And it actually, prose in, prose in the book breaks into poetry at some, at some points. And we, where we don't, we are not sure who is talking right now or which side of the character, how the character is talking. Yeah. Yeah. So poetic in the sense of the poet is the person who 
uses language to shape uh, the approach to the world, right? And, and does so in kind of an experimental way, trying things out, and then, then many of them fail. And right. some of them occasionally succeed, and you never quite know why this combination worked, but, but you know that it did. did. Mm. Yeah, I would that, say also that's, that's this. That's a great for. Oh, thank you. I would say also, uh, because I read for this uh, series of conversations, I read uh, Herman Hesse's, Herman Hesse's uh, Demian, mm. uh, which is, in, it is a great book to contrast with the beginning place. In Demian, we have a character, the main character, uh, who is very solipsistic. And from the beginning to end, we don't know whether he's imagining the entire world or he's entering into a relationship with people who are actually out there. So it is yeah. all about him, self-centered. Um, and in contrast, the beginning place is very relational. Yeah. And the second big difference is that a book like Demian, the character begins in, at home, begins at a, a kind of comfort zone, and then slowly is introduced to strangeness, to a foreign place outside. But in the beginning place, the characters discover home. They don't begin uh, at their home-like comfort or place that they yeah. feel like they belong. But they discover it, and then they move on to... Uh, exploring it more yeah Showing and, and, and in the very end they are there's there's a home so there's there's first the home that isn't a home home of bad, bad relationships with with, with parents uh, primarily with mothers on, on both sides um and being stuck you know i mean the, the guy is is stuck as a gross grocery clerk when he'd like to go off and become become a librarian um, and and then there's the uh, the the other other place, um, and that's it is a beginning plan that it, it can be getting a home for them, them. But it's not truly their home. It really does belong to the people of that world. And then they come back out, and and they, it ends with them, um, you know, deciding to stay together and and form their their future. But it's a totally uncertain future. We don't know whether their relationship works out or not. But now they're ready to to actually be adults. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right, all right, Greg. I know it is where you are. It's, uh, it's approaching late in the evening, so maybe we can, at this, uh, yeah. this enticing uh, moment, we can leave the audience behind. <laughs> yeah, so, that sounds good. I very much, very much enjoy. It. I always like, like you know, hanging out, hanging out with. Um, mm -hmm. um, we've we've only ever done this uh, half halfway in the world, so. so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll both be in the same place at the same time, you know? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good.